Hello, today is September 9th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Michael S. Lang. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born uh, March 25th. 1983 in Weymouth, Massachusetts. And you currently <coughs> reside in Weymouth? I do. And are you, your marital status? I am engaged. Congratulations. Thank you. When is the wedding planned for? We, uh, we're planning for June of next year, of 2009. You grew up in Weymouth? Born and raised. Yes, ma'am. And did you graduate from Weymouth High School? I did, what class year? of 2001. <clears throat> Where and when did you enter the military? I entered the military August 10th, 2000. And where? Uh, right out of Boston. Why? Why did you join at that time? Uh, ever since I was a, a little kid. I've, uh, I've always wanted to be in the military. <clears throat> For some strange reason, I don't know why. I know, you know people grow up to want to be doctors or lawyers. I just always had a, uh, a knack for joining the service. And what branch did you join? Uh, the Army. And why did you choose the Army? Uh, well, I'm not a very good swimmer. <laughs> and uh, I am, uh, to a point, afraid of heights. So really narrowed it down to where I was going to go. But uh, the Army has always, always had my eye on the Army. <clears throat> now you mentioned 2000. Did you mean to, you said you graduated from Weymouth High in 2001. Mm -hmm. So you entered early? Mm -hmm. Explain that. I was 17, uh, coming into my senior year of high school, <clears throat> and I joined the Army Reserves uh, with my parents' permission. So did that take you away once a month or? Um, that one, it did. Uh, I was to report to Worcester, uh, to a military police unit uh, for the job training. And I did that until uh, I went to basic training in July of 2001. And where was your basic training? Uh, Fort Leonard, Missouri. What was that like? <clears throat> the basic training or Fort Leonard? Both. Uh, the basic training was, uh, was pretty intense. Um, I know people say you know, they have their own versions of the Army or their own versions of uh, boot camp or basic training. Um, it was intense, but as long as you uh, had the will to pass, you were going to pass. Now, did you have to do any kind of basic training or early training when you were at first a senior in high school? <clears throat> Uh, not a, no um, any additional nothing training. like what no, you yeah. went through with basic. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I did. I just remember it was a while ago. I did go for a weekend uh, to Fort Devens, or what's left of Fort Devens, um, and I went for a weekend where they had actual drill sergeants uh, in the reserves or National Guard, and they gave us the uh, a good taste of uh, what it'd be like uh, at basic training for two days. And having done that, you still wanted to stay in? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Did everyone else feel that way? I'm sure they didn't. <laughs> Tell us about Fort Underwood. Had you done any other traveling outside of Massachusetts prior to going to Missouri? Uh, Fort Underwood, uh, any traveling outside? Yes, I have, but mostly vacations. Uh, vacation spots like New Hampshire or Florida, things of that nature, but mm -hmm. uh, never to the Midwest. What was your first impressions? <laughs> well, the first impression was I was the Yank. I knew that much. Um, it was hot because it was in July. It was about, uh, about mid-90s the whole time, and it was very humid. <clears throat> Were the people friendly? Which people? both in your basic training and perhaps when you were on leave at all, if you did any traveling around that area? Uh, for basic training, we, uh, we stayed in a, I stayed in a 40-man bay. 
<coughs> it's just a very large area where uh, bunks and footlockers are set up. Uh, I did meet a lot of uh, good people. I do, I do remember meeting um, a few people. One, uh, my battle buddy, as you're called, you're the person who's pretty much teamed up next to you, uh, or is your bunk mate, uh, Jeremy Legault, and he was from uh, Constable, New York. Do you keep in touch with him? I have. I, uh, I recently uh, got re-in touch with him due to the deployments and uh, st uh, stringent schedules we've both had uh, gone our separate ways in the Army. It was hard to keep track of each other, but we managed. Now, prior to this interview, you mentioned, and we'll move forward, but you're still in the Army? Yes, I am in the National Guard. Currently in the National Guard. Yes, ma'am. Once you were finished with BASIC or during your training service uh, beyond BASIC, did you receive any advanced or specialized training? Uh, yes. Every uh, soldier in the Army receives what they call AIT, that's Advanced Individual Training, <clears throat> and it pretty much trains you on the selected job you chose coming into the Army. And what was yours? Military Police. And so you continued on in that respect? I have. How was it determined that you could advance to military police, um, having taken tests or back when you were in the reserves as a senior? When you join the Army, <clears throat> you have to take the ASVAB test, the Armed Services uh, voc uh, Vocational Aptitude Battery, and that will grade and assess you on uh, certain areas and certain job aspects for the Army, and they'll give the Army a better idea of where you could be uh, utilized best uh, in your service. <clears throat> for me, I had picked military police and qualified for it. What was your first duty station after BASIC or after any additional training from BASIC? My actual first duty station was uh, Worcester, Massachusetts because I was Army Reserves. Now, you were Army Reserve as a senior. Did that continue yes. on then after yes. basic training? Yes, it did, ma'am. Same unit, uh, same uh, location, everything. The other thing that changed was now they what they call MOSQ, your Military Occupational Specialty Qualified, or I was Military Police Qualified. So I was certified by the Army to be a military policeman. And were you an MP in Worcester? Yes, I was. Would it be every day? No, it was a, uh, as you've seen on commercials, I'm sure, the one week in a month, two weeks a year. Uh, that's what I was doing at the time, was going up there uh, on a weekend and training on military police uh, duties. And <clears throat> when you were sent to Worcester, were you sent there as an individual, as part of a unit, or? Uh, basically what happens is everybody uh, who's assigned to that unit uh, you could be from, I know we had some guys from Tewksbury, Worcester, Natick. Uh, we had a lot of people from uh, the Springfield area. Uh, we'd all meet up on that weekend. Now whether you carpooled with somebody because they lived in your town, which I did carpool with somebody because uh, one actually lived in Quincy, uh, a mm -hmm. friend of mine, and we just went up together. So what was a typical weekend like when you were there just for the weekend? I know you said you did some continual training as an MP, did they give you scenarios to work on or? A few times they would. Uh, a lot of time it would be classroom training. Um, they'd pick a, <clears throat> uh, um, a certain aspect of your job, uh, how to write um, you know, a, a military ticket, how mm -hmm. to uh, pull somebody over correctly, uh, the proper procedures of searching somebody, whatever the, uh, the senior uh, sergeants or officers chose. Uh, for that particular uh, weekend. Now, did you go into this knowing that you might then be <coughs> commissioned is not the correct word, but to go overseas? To deploy? Deploy, thank you. Um, yeah. When I joined, I joined prior to 9-11. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I went to basic training, we were fighting, as we would say, Ivan, <coughs> which was the term used, you know, to fight the, the Russians and uh, all that uh, I guess you would say the, the Eastern Bloc. 
So I was training to go to uh, Kosovo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, places of that nature. That's what I was training to do. Uh, actually, my first day at MP school was September 11, 2001. What was that like for you, knowing what was going on or, or sensing as the day went on how drastic a measure had been taken against the U.S.? I remember that day because we were up before the attacks happened. We uh, had done physical training and got dressed for the duty day. Uh, we went to the classroom and at about 9 o'clock we all went outside and usually when they bring us outside it's just to have a break, get out of the classroom for 10 minutes. Kind of like a, a smoke break without actually smoking. And um, I do remember vaguely, or vividly actually I should say, drill sergeants pagers and cell phones going off. Almost, uh, almost uh, you, you know, unanimously. Just together all at like once. It was weird. I was like, you know, what was going on? And they had said that a plane crashed into uh, the World Trade Center in New York. And now our first thought was, that's a lousy pilot because we thought maybe it's a, cl you know, it's a cloudy day, it's very, you know, it happens. We, mm -hmm. No one was thinking, at least that I know of when I talked to, and I talked to a lot of people there, of any kind of a terrorist attack. And then shortly thereafter, about an hour later, when the, after the second plane had already hit, we're all kind of, you know, steaming, still weren't sure what was going on. And then I think that uh, the following night or day, we got to actually see it on TV, like and how they repeated it over and over on TV. And our uh, first sergeant, who's the uh, company first sergeant, that's pretty much the, the head uh, non-commissioned officer, uh, told us what had happened and what's going on. So that definitely changed my outlook on the military. In what way? Uh, as far as uh, I felt at first scared. I was scared out of my mind. You know, I didn't know what to do. I was thinking, you know, when, you, when you're not thinking rationally, you, you know, you, you think the worst. Uh, I was thinking I'm going to go some foreign country, you know, might get hurt, killed, whatever, um, do something I don't want to do maybe. But after, uh, after thinking about it and realizing why I was at, you know, why I was in the Army and the drill sergeants talking to us, you know, person to person or in groups, we realized it's like this is, if no other time, the perfect time to serve your country. You know, it needs you now more than ever. And, you know, they pretty much asked us to step up to the plate. And I know a lot of us have. So how long did you stay in Worcester before you were deployed? About a year. I came back from basic training uh, in November of 2001. And we deployed to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba in October of 2002. And you were at Guantanamo Bay? For what purpose? To be a part of the guard force guarding the Taliban and Al-Qaeda suspects. Talk about that. What was it like? We've heard mixed messages from the newscasters about what went on there, whether it be right or wrong. Give us your sense of what went on and, and your, for instance, a daily routine for you. Okay. Uh, a daily routine would be waking up uh, during whatever shift you had. There was three shifts. Uh, your morning, your swings, and your mids. Uh, depending on what, I usually had the mid, uh, the midnight shift, so I didn't have to wake up till about eight o'clock at night uh, to work ten, uh, ten at night till six in the morning. Uh, we wake up, go do what they call a guard mount, which is the um, kind of like the daily briefing. Everybody sits there and they tell us what had happened uh, since last shift or any, anything uh, of interest, such as I remember we were down there in November. Ramadan, which is one of the Muslims' holy months uh, of fasting, they told us that that was going on. So to those of us who didn't know anything about Islam, uh, found out very quickly what Ramadan was and how they uh, perceived it as. So they didn't really give you any information ahead of time about the different culture that you might be working with, or did they? They gave us a, a briefing, but we had, uh, at the time that I was down there, we had over 600 prisoners from 42 different countries speaking seven different languages. I guess if you want to talk about a diverse culture, that's uh, one way of putting it. Did you have any, do you speak a different language besides English? Um, at the time, I have, uh, was pretty fluent in Arabic. I've mostly lost it because I have nobody to train with, uh, nobody to speak it to, so. So did you converse with those who spoke that language? I tried not to. 
-hmm. I used it mostly as a listening purpose uh, because if we heard anything, whether it was because a lot of them can speak English or speak multiple languages. I know here in America, you know, speaking two languages is, people think that's above average. A lot of them who live over in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and those areas, uh, speaking two, three languages is the norm. Mm -hmm. That's something they have to do just to get by. Where, like we said here, we can all speak English and pretty much get away on a daily day basis where they weren't as fortunate. So they were forced to or would have to learn two or three different languages. So though I may understand Arabic, some of them might have spoke what they call Urdu or Pashtu, uh, Yugar, Dari, uh, just you can go on and on with all these languages that most people have never heard of. And I never heard of them too until I went down there. What was the average age of the prisoner? I don't know. Mm -hmm. they, would, they, they kept a lot from us, which was good because, you know, I'm not going to say that ignorance was bliss, but we didn't know anybody's status down there as far as we know. That way you could treat them all accordingly. If you knew one was responsible for a certain terrorist act and one was kind of in limbo, you know, you can't really, you know, you can't really say, okay, well, we know this guy did something bad and we're not sure about this guy, but we don't know, so how do we deal with it? So we went according to pro uh, protocol or the SOP, the Standard Operating Procedures, and we treated them according to that, which is written by uh, the general of that post. So basically, in your time down there, you treated everyone equally? Yes, ma'am. Were there any incidences that you can share with us that kind of stick out in your mind as being interesting? Was I would say define, it, uh, define a, uh, a moment, if you will, because people have asked me questions of that nature, you know, what went on down there? Well, I what think you, you think of Abu Ghraib or Abu Ghraib of course. And, and think, okay, did that happen elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Or um, did you find that some MPs, for instance, were a little more um, not treating according to the code, maybe treating some a little differently. A little harsher. Possibly say. harsher. Mm -hmm. um, from what I have experienced and what I had saw personally at first hand, um, no, you know, second hand involved, I would say that everybody was pretty much on the same, uh, on the same line. Mm -hmm. We all had the same, you know, mode of thought. Uh, we had also been training with each other for uh, six months to a year, so we knew each other. So it wasn't like, you know, you didn't know who that person was or what they were capable of doing. A lot of times I worked with two or three guys for six, seven months of training, and then we went down there for nine months and operated together. So we were very, uh, we were very intact with each other. We knew exactly what was going on. So you'd worked with them in Worcester? Mm-hmm. So you went down, even though you were sort of individuals, you did go down as a unit? We went down as a, mm -hmm. uh, as a company. What was it like when you were not working? What did you do uh, like to off fill time? Mm -hmm. Off time. Um, well, a lot of us, uh, I know because Guantanamo Bay is a, is a Navy base, so it's not like some secluded area. I mean, it is very secluded if you want to uh, talk about where it's located, but uh, as far as things to do down there, they had a gym. You could go to uh, and work out if you'd like. I know they had some softball leagues or, uh, or basketball leagues, things of that nature. Um, because you're on an island, you can go, obviously go fishing or swimming if you'd like. And uh, we did all those to, to pretty much pass the time, have a little barbecue outside uh, on our grills or our little hibachis. So we made the time work. Um, were you basically confined, though, to that site? We were confined to the base. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you can't go into Cuba. Uh, we're not exactly on uh, the best of terms with them right now, or at least at that time anyways. So, Did you meet any individuals who worked for the base but were civilians? Uh, we had a lot of civilians working as interrogators, um, as interpreters, uh, private contractors who would <clears throat> do the maintenance of the, uh, of the prison, or the detention facility, I should say. Uh, so we would interact uh, and work uh, side by side, hand in hand with uh, civilians and non-military personnel. And were any of them free to discuss what their living conditions were like, for instance, if they lived or grew up in Cuba? Um, well, we had no Cubans. None. 
No. Um, so these were perhaps <coughs> from the U.S. or other these areas? These workers were from other uh, countries. I do remember uh, a bunch of them being from uh, India and uh, another uh, handful being from the Philippines. And they would all work for uh, Kellogg Brown and Root was the main company down there. Uh, How long were you at Guantanamo Bay? I was there from November of 2002 to August 2003. And then what happened? We deployed back home to Worcester. And you were deployed at home for how long? I was home for uh, about nine months before I left the Army Reserves and joined active duty Army. Now <clears throat> why did you do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I could say there's a thousand reasons, but I just wanted to do it. I, like I said, I've always wanted to be in the Army, and I, I used the reserves as almost kind of like a trial period. If I had not liked it or I wasn't satisfied with uh, the results the Army had uh, given me or you know, if I felt uncomfortable about being in the Army, then I would have just stayed in the reserves and, as I say, you know, serve out your time. It's almost like a sentence, it sounds like. But uh, I decided, you know, I, I did like it very much, mm -hmm. um, even under the harshest conditions. So I thought to myself, I can't imagine active duty being too much worse, and it wasn't. And I think I made the right choice when I, uh, I left home uh, July of 2004 and went up to Fort Drum, New York. I'm sorry, what fort? Fort Drum, D-R-U-M. Fort Drum in New York. Yes, ma'am. Right? It's about an hour north of Syracuse. And how long were you at Fort Drum, and what was the difference in, in did you have to go through basic again, or no? no? Um, I was at Drum from July of 2004 to March of 2008, and uh, the Army active duty life is actually it's pretty impressive. I wasn't it wasn't too bad. It, it was kind of like a uh, now I've never been to college, but I have visited uh, many friends who were in college. And uh, if you're a single soldier, you know, not married or don't have any dependents, uh, you lived in barracks, which is looked just like a dorm room. You, know, you have you they. Uh, supply you with a bed, um, a desk, chair, you know, pretty much the basic amenities you need just to, you know, live. Uh, you'd have a sink, small fridge, or actually I know we got uh, the larger fridges. Uh, that was nice, um, and a locker, so you could you could manage. Very so it was well. very much like dorm living. Yes, it was. Um, what was your rank when you went to Fort Drum? I was a specialist. Any class? Um, no, specialist. Uh, just specialist. It's mm -hmm. the uh, it's the equivalent to a, a corporal, but a specialist is not what they call a non-commissioned officer, which is the sergeant ranks. Right. So, I was just a lovely specialist. Now, did you stay at Fort Drum? Have Have you gone anywhere else besides Fort Drum in your? Uh, when I was duties? at Fort Drum, mm -hmm. we had gone. Uh, in March of 2006 to uh, Fort Irwin, the National Training Center in Fort Irwin, California. It's right there in the desert. And you trained there for what reason? Uh, we trained there for about a month uh, in preparation for our deployment to Iraq, which was be coming up uh, in that, uh, that August. August of 06? Yes, ma'am. What was it like when you knew, I mean, did you know even leaving Fort Drum that you would be going to Iraq? Did when you I, assume uh, that or? The, uh, the story is with Fort Drum is that Fort Drum is your mailing address. That's where your mail is going to go. And when I heard that, I pretty much got the idea. Uh, as of right now, uh, the 10th Mountain Division, which is the division that is up there, is the most deployed division in the United States Army. And was that your division? Yes, ma'am. And again, it's the 10th? Mountain Division. So you kind of knew yes, that it would happen eventually. Eventually. It, was it difficult for you not knowing when it was going to be, or did you just take each day at a time? I just took day every, as it came. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you knew it was going to come. You didn't know if it was going to be Afghanistan. You didn't know if it was going to be Iraq. You just knew you were going to be going somewhere soon. And I guess I was one of the fortunate ones. I actually had the privilege of living at Fort Drum for two whole years before I deployed. Mm -hmm. I know some people who have lived there for about two weeks. And then had to go and over. And then would go over. So once you finished your month or so at Fort Irwin, how did you get to Iraq? Uh, we took a, 
We actually took a civilian plane from Fort Drum Airfield, uh, the Wheelersack Airfield, and flew us to Maine. I believe it's where they flew us. Now my details may be, uh, they might skip around a little bit because a lot of sleeping, a lot of downtime. Didn't know if it was light or day or how long you've been flying for and a watch was no better. Uh, I know we sat in Maine for a couple hours. I know they had to rechange uh, or change out the crew and whatever it was. And then we flew from Maine to Germany. And that was also in a civilian, uh, civilian plane. And why do you think that was? What's that? Using a civilian plane. It carries more people, um, especially with the amount we were having. We were, they were flying, uh, they were, we were packed, uh, packed in there pretty good. Did you have any with you who had been initially with you in Worcester on that plane? No, I didn't. So this was uh, I had left all those guys, all, all those guys behind. Um, I mean, they were a great bunch of guys, but. So know. how long were you in Germany before you went to Iraq? We were there for about a day if that, maybe about a half a day. And then we flew to Kuwait. And Kuwait is the staging area. That's where everybody, or all the units go. Um, where you get your briefings on Iraq, you get your acclimation to the weather, um, you get any additional training you might need, any additional equipment you may need. And then uh, usually about three to four weeks after being in Kuwait, uh, the units start going to Iraq. So were you there for three or four weeks? Is that what happened? Uh, yes, I was there for, uh, from the 13th of August till actually the 30th of August. And when you say acclimate to the weather, what hit you about the weather, do you think? Well, I've never, uh, I've never been in 138 degree weather wearing 60 pounds of equipment, so I think that hit me pretty good. In doing that, did you? I, I can't imagine being in that type of atmosphere. <laughs> what, what was it like? I mean, what did did you get sick? Did you? Um, some people did. I know some people. The, you know, the change, a drastic change in weather, uh, as it was, uh, could get sick. Um, as crazy it may sound, get uh, you know, become a heat weather or a hot weather injury. Um, things like uh, heat stroke. Um, heat exhaustion, any of those heat cramps, any and all people probably got them at one point or another, excessive sweating. Just, but they must different. have kept you hydrated. Quite, oh, yes. Or you, it was your responsibility um, to keep hydrated. It was your responsibility, and uh, if you had a, uh, everybody had a sergeant, so they would, uh, they would take care of you. And I was uh, actually privileged to be a sergeant uh, deployed with this unit. Uh, I had two soldiers, actually I had four at the time to take care of, so I made sure they would drink water, I'd make sure they were doing okay, I'd pretty much be their mother. So from Fort Drum where you were a specialist, by the time you got to Kuwait you were a sergeant? I was, um, I got to Drum in July of 2004, May of 2005, or actually March of 2005, I went to the board where they have all the senior sergeants, uh, men and women who have been in the army longer than mostly, most of us have been alive, and they would uh, give us a series of questions, uh, <clears throat> drills, anything. Uh, just a long, drawn-out test, and they would test to see how well you were prepared to become uh, a non-commissioned officer. And I passed that test. So, I guess I was, uh, I guess I was qualified in their eyes. Which you would have no, you know, you'd have no other wanting to test you but those kind of uh, those kinds of people. What was the leadership like for you throughout all of this? It changed. It, it definitely changed uh, both in styles and personnel. Um, you can train all day in a garrison environment, which is you know training at your own home base, and that's you know your your leadership style will definitely change when you when you know from pra it's almost like from practice to game day, it will change, and uh, it was actually pretty good. <clears throat> I had a lot of good, competent uh, NCOs, and when I refer to NCOs, that's the, the sergeants. Non-commissioned officers. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> so 
So once you finished up in Kuwait, did you kind of take a deep breath and say, okay, here it goes, now it's off to Iraq, or was it just... I think it was, uh, I do remember me and a couple other guys, we all, uh, we all got some cigars, and uh, kind of one of those last, uh, one of those last minute things you want to do, and we just kind of said, okay, ready for the, you know, it's kind of like you're ready for game day. We, uh, we all kind of looked at each other, and we knew right then and there, we, re we realized something, you know, just sitting there, and it, and it was never said, it didn't have to be, it was something that's unspoken, that we had a very good chance of knowing that uh, one or many of us may not be coming back, or at least the same. But we all accepted uh, why we volunteered, why we signed up, and we went without hesitation. And what part of Iraq did you go to? I went to South Baghdad. Um, <clears throat> the Saddam International Airport uh, was acquired by the U.S. Armed Forces and I was stationed at Camp Stryker. Were you in any direct combat? Uh, at first, no I wasn't. Um, for the first year I was there actually, I was doing detainee operations. Um, you would hear mortar attacks, you would hear sporadic gunfire, but nothing was ever um, danger close. When I left that particular uh, platoon to go to another one, to go to the MP platoon, now uh, we went out to uh, uh, the south area, you know, the southern part of Baghdad, and there we, uh, we didn't have any direct combat, but I do remember one instance where uh, me and another sergeant were recruiting uh, Iraqi police and Iraqi military so we could build up their forces uh, to help us and help their country. And then I do remember a, uh, a couple gun, uh, gunshots going off in the distance at first. Now the distance wasn't too far, it was maybe 100 meters. And then about 10, 15 minutes later, because we didn't think anything of it, I mean, after a while you just get used to it. But then uh, about 10, 15 minutes later, uh, we saw dust actually kick up right in front of us and we heard the ping noise. So we knew very quickly and very uh, abruptly that we were taking fire. Uh, so me and him got to a, uh, you know, got some conf uh, cover and concealment and just, you know, pretty much scanned the area hoping to find this person or uh, people who were uh, shooting at us. We never did. Um, we went about our mission. And that was pretty much the only thing that we ever got. Uh, at least when I was with them now, they. That whole year, they had been getting, uh, they had been taking fire and have gotten IEDs, and we actually had lost uh, four MPs from that platoon. Now this platoon is only of 40 people. So out of so 40, you lost four. We lost four. And were they friends? Ah, uh, yes, they were. Two Just of them I was uh, exceptionally close to. The other two I was more of on a, uh, on a professional basis with them. It, nothing personal. It's just, you know, you can only be friends with so many people. But the, uh, the two, uh, Sergeant William Bowling and Sergeant Eric Vick, I was uh, particularly close to, uh, not just in Iraq, but during our training. This is going back uh, 18 months, two years prior to going to Iraq. We were pretty close together. Have you been in touch with their families since you've been back? I have been in touch with both uh, of their wives um, through instant messaging, phone calls. Uh, I don't keep in contact with them uh, regularly, but I would say probably two, three times a month uh, I'll talk to one or the other, or both, um, and see just see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they appreciate it, and you know, it's not something that I feel I have to do, it's something I want to do. Because want to make sure, friends. Of course, and I want to make sure that they're doing good. And are they back with family, or are they... The wives? The wives. Yes, I know one is uh, living in Kentucky right now and the other one is living in South Carolina, I believe, or North Carolina, rather. I know you mentioned earlier about that unspoken word that some may not come back and so, mm -hmm. in fact, you lived that. Mm -hmm. and what was that like for you, losing friends? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, again, it's just one of those things. You know, we, like I said, you can accept it all day but what if it what if it does happen? You can't. It's it's hard to to fathom. It's hard. It's hard to gather your thoughts and actually think, or uh, perceive the thought of you know, I just lost 
you know, two, three, four of my, of my good friends. Mm -hmm. Guys who I know those two right there, I, I definitely would have uh, invited to my wedding. Um, you know, guys you can go on uh, a kind of like a, a weekend trip. You know, those are the kind of guys you, can, you could count on mm -hmm. to be there for you. And you know, they're gone. Did it, that and also the fact that you were fired upon and, and very close to you, did that make you even more alert or it, it didn't change your alert, you were ready anyway? Did it, it change definitely, uh, It definitely renewed my, uh, my readiness. Uh, you know, you, you're out there for so long, you don't, you don't take any fire, you don't take any uh, uh, motor attacks or anything like that. Nothing goes off in your area and everything's, you know, like what it should be, peace and quiet, and all of a sudden the abrupt noise happens. You know, you, uh, it definitely renewed uh, our, in mine personally, uh, my alertness and my readiness uh, for, you know, any kind of combat that may occur. You were stationed at Camp Stryker and overseeing um, prisoners? At the time I wasn't. What was the difference in that versus Guantanamo Bay? The, there really actually wasn't too much of a difference. Um, the one we had was kind of a more of a, uh, it wasn't uh, as complex, I would say, uh, in Iraq as it was in Gitmo. Uh, Gitmo, they would have, you know, everything was, you know, stationed, you know, set up right, correctly, this and that, where in Iraq we pretty much commandeered uh, a building. I think it was actually a, uh, an old office building for the Iraqi Air Force. And we just, you know, we made cells, um, put a, you know, a cage door in front of it, uh, cleaned out the cells, gave them, you know, their, you know, their needs, and that was really about it. But we were not the permanent prison. That was probably the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. uh, down there, you know, the guys you, that are down in Getmo when I left were still down there, whereas we cycled through, I know I cycled through at least well over four or five hundred uh, in the course of me being there for a year. And in cycling them through, they went from there to we possibly were, Guantanamo Bay? No. no. Okay. We were uh, what we call a DHA. Uh, D -H -A, uh, it's a uh, holding area, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what we are. It's just a holding area. When you mentioned training or recruiting the police, did you also train them? No, we didn't. The we Iraqis just recruited them. you recruited? Yes, there was a, uh, a separate entity from us who would train them. So, who would make the decision who to or who not to recruit? We would set up. Uh, kind of like a recruiting center in the areas that we were assigned to. We brought out a, a test, actually. Um, it was a literacy test, uh, any kind of uh, history test, a family test, you know, just give them a test. Some of the questions would be, you know, have you ever been a loyalist to Saddam? Has your family ever been involved? And the, you know, questions that you have to ask that they seem almost, uh, you know, the questions almost seem I don't even know what the word is, just, you, you kind of look at the question like, why would you ask me this? It's almost like I would, uh, I don't know, it's just, when I looked at that test, I just like, because it would be in English and in Arabic, and you look at it, and be like, you know, have you ever uh, fired upon the, you know, the U.S. forces? Well, uh, if I'm taking a test, you know, say for Natick police, and it says, have you ever, you know, beat up a Natick police officer, do you really think I'm going to put down yes, yes or no, you know? Right. It's just one of those things that I thought was one of the uh, moments in the Army where you're just like, and there it is. <laughs> you know? so. so who knew, knows what kind of clientele we may be getting because exactly. they can answer the test however How they, yes. the Army wants them to answer. Or however they, whatever better their chances of getting hired by their police or their Army. Uh, talking a little bit more about also the climate, you mentioned the climate. Do you think your clothing and your equipment were adequate for where you were? I think the, uh, the clothing got better. I know when uh, a few people who were there, uh, there'd be a lot of splits, uh, a lot of um, holes in your, in your jacket or in your pants. 
from excessive use or too much or you know weak fabric. But I know we uh, we started double stitching them and started getting better, uh, tougher material, and they kind of uh, solved that problem for us about midway through. When you were at Camp Stryker, describe what the terrain is like. I know you mentioned the heat, and mm -hmm. um, is it deserty? Yes, with trees. With trees. Yes, uh, as few and far between, but there were trees. Um, if you can imagine, just a uh, kind of like a plain, you know, just a, uh, like a um, like the Great Plains. Just imagine that just built up with. Uh, you know, airplane hangars and uh, trailers, you know, um, and again, trailers. on your, um, when you were not on watch or on duty, what did you do there for relaxation? They had what they call an MWR tent, uh, the Morale, Welfare, and Recreation tent. Uh, there you could watch uh, satellite TV, which you could get like ESPN or a movie channel. Uh, the Armed Forces uh, Network would supply sports, weather, you know, news. So you could do that. Um, they had a basketball court, uh, a mini, I would say a mini, uh, like football co uh, football field, but it's more like a football dirt. <laughs> it wasn't much of a field. Um, the tent also had like uh, movies. You could, you know, people. A lot of the stuff that MWR got were donated from the American people, mm -hmm. or people leaving. You know, some people would leave them. Would be, you know leave and say, hey, I don't. You know, I've watched this movie a hundred times. I don't want to watch it anymore. I'm going to donate it. I know for a fact I donated uh, four Xbox games. Just I played them way too much and I got bored of them. And instead of trying to wait to go home and turn them in, I said, hey, maybe you know some soldiers here could use it. So I did that instead. And how long were you in Baghdad, South Baghdad? Fifteen months. Were Were there ever times when you were close to being um, wounded, or were you wounded? I had some hearing loss to my left ear. About because that, of about the 30%. explosions. Yes, I do remember what happened that day. Uh, I was around uh, mid-May. What had happened was the. Uh, mortars had come in, um, and where I was staying, it was very, uh, the acoustics in there were very loud. So it's, it's like almost like a, uh, think of a hallway where you yell down into it and you can hear the echo. Mm -hmm. well, these explosions were pretty close, and uh, I was walking down one of the hallways, and it just got me at that time, and nothing had hit me, nothing had interrupted, it's just the sound purely uh, ruptured my eardrum or, or damaged my eardrum to the point where I lost about 30% hearing. Now when you say mid-May, would that have been in 2006? Seven. Seven, Seven. at that point. Did you get treatment, immediate treatment, or did you not realize how severe it was? I didn't really realize it. Um, again, with all the noise going on all day, I mean, it's not exactly the most quiet place to be uh, with we're right next to an airfield, or an airport, I should say, where planes and helicopters are landing on a daily basis. Uh, so I didn't really know till I'd say about a week or two after, where I, you know, things would quiet down, and I'm kind of like, it. I'm still having a hard time. I can hear it in one side of my ear clearly, and then the other side is, it's almost like somebody turned the volume down. And did you seek medical ass assistance at that point? I talked to the doctor there, and he... Uh, you know, right there, you couldn't really do much for me because it was a, you know, they were just there as almost like a first aid. It wasn't anything uh, excessive, but in fear of possibly leaving Iraq or in fear of getting a kind of treatment where I, not, I will not be with my soldiers, I decided to decline it and didn't bother uh, seeking a second opinion. So you wanted to stay? Yes, ma'am. And it's not to be uh, heroic or to, uh, to, to win awards or medals or anything like that. It's not what I'm asking for. I just wanted the opportunity to serve my soldiers. And any non-commissioned officer, any officer would say the same thing. 
Did you hear, I, I know you mentioned being able to see some of the news. Did you hear um, on a daily basis about progress in other areas of Iraq or even in Afghanistan? We heard them, but a lot of us, you know, we're all there, so we really didn't want to hear about it. We rather hear about what's going on with uh, the Red Sox winning the World Series or uh, how the Patriots are doing. Well, at least I know I did. Um, some of my platoon mates didn't particularly like the Red Sox or the Patriots because they were doing so well. And I was the only one from the New England area who liked those teams. So, but no, we, we really didn't, I know I personally didn't pay attention to what was going on in other areas. I just paid attention to what was going on in our brigade uh, area of operation, uh, in the Baghdad area, and then, like I said, news, weather, sports at home. Did you get a lot of mail from home? I think I got a, a, a substantial amount, yes and am. Were you able to get any kind of R&R &R away from that area while you were over there? Yes, ma'am. Um, I got leave. Uh, they call it, that's actually what it was referred to as R&R &R, uh, for leave. Rest and uh, relaxation. relaxation. Yes, mm -hmm. ma'am. And where did you go? How long a leave was it? It was uh, two weeks. Where did you go? I was getting back home. Came you, back home. You came home. Was it hard then to leave to go back? To leave Iraq leave or to leave Leave home here? to go back to Iraq or? It really wasn't because I knew I, I hadn't finished uh, my, my tour over there. I, haven't, I did not finish my duty, so to speak. So if they had asked me, hey, do you want to stay home permanently? I just, no, can't. It's, you know, I, I feel I have a certain responsibility for my soldiers and for the mission at hand. And that into itself, uh, I would have uh, many sleepless nights if I had stayed home instead of gone back. While you were home, was it difficult for you? Did people ask you a lot of questions? Um, or did they more or less? A lot of people, I would say, majority of family and friends were respectful. Uh, and I say respectful simply because they, I think they, you know, they chose uh, discretion as far as uh, coming to me personally. Now, I don't mind if they want to come to me and ask me uh, what my experience has been, but a lot of them just, you know, would ask, hey, is it good to be back? What have you been up to? Um, but I did get the occasional, how do you think we're doing over there? Do you think it's right or wrong? Where, you know, my, my opinion, I tell them, you know, is it right or wrong? It doesn't matter, we're there now, you know? That's a very good point. <clears throat> Do you feel you were properly trained and equipped for what you faced over there? I think I was definitely properly trained. Uh, the equipment, yeah, I would definitely say yes. The uh, equipment was, uh, it got better too. Uh, we got more equipment or uh, better equipment, I should say, more improved. So as you know, time progressed, we were getting better and better. But I think for the most part, we were trained on everything we could probably be trained on. You know, I mean, a police officer can be trained on how to do uh, a routine traffic stop and a thousand times they'll do it correct. And that one time when they say it's routine, you know, you've seen all these shows where something goes awry. It's how they're going to react. You know, they can say, oh, I'd react like this. You, you say you react one way or another way, but nobody really knows until they're presented uh, the, that situation. And were you presented with any difficult situations where you reacted differently than you thought you would react? Not that I can recall. Um, I would say that would stick out in my mind if I had. Uh, I do remember we had um, prisoners who were uh, not acting according to uh, the rules and regulations we posted up in their uh, cells for them to read and they were also told by an interpreter how uh, the camp was run. And when we reacted to it, we reacted correctly. We, uh, we neutralized the situation and pretty much brought the peace back. Now when you say you neutralized the situation, explain to a civilian like me what that means. Uh, what it might mean. Basically something was going wrong and through our training and through, I would say, common sense, but not all sense is common, um, we brought the situation back to order. We brought back, uh, as you would say, law and order. We, we brought back the, uh, the order of the camp. 
to maintain good order, I would say. So perhaps taking one of the instigators out of the situation, Could be. putting him or her elsewhere. Yes, ma'am. And speaking of that, were there women prisoners? We did not receive any women. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a hole in the facility designated for women. Um, I don't know if, they, if those facilities did get them, but we never had. We, um, the youngest we could accept was 16. Uh, and the oldest, I mean, I saw, uh, I saw Father Time over there myself. It's just a man who was very, uh, who was very old. Now, do you think he looked older because of a hard life? Sometimes you would see that. We found out that he was 72. And I would imagine that, yes, the hard life, he, I'm sure he did live a uh, uh, not so comforting life. Um, he had to have a walker when he went to and from, uh, so I can imagine compared to say uh, somebody who maybe is fortunate like you know, somebody here in America, uh, I, I played golf with a 72 year old who was walking around and shooting better than I was mm -hmm. and then you go over there and you see a 72 year old who's you know, not for not on their last, you know, on their last leg, mm -hmm. so it could have been a, an issue. But a lot of the times we have somebody like that is because they respect their elders over there. So he may have been a part of a bigger uh, operation. He may have been the one who's saying, you know, we should attack this or uh, that. It's hard to change somebody's mind at that age. Sure. You know, they say teach an old dog new tricks. Not with them. Yeah. Now, how, after you came home for two weeks and then you went back, so how long were you in Iraq totally? Uh, Fifteen months. Fifteen months, you mm -hmm. said that, right. And when you came home, you weren't discharged because you were, you've made this a career, basically, yes? Um, the jury's still out on that one. Okay, so what's your status right now? I am a National Guardsman. Uh, so did you actually get discharged from regular army? Yes, I did. And when was that? That was uh, March of 2008. I got an honorable discharge. So now you're back to where you began almost, right? Pretty much, except it's now the National Guard. So uh, I think I'm one of the few people who can say they've served in all three uh, army branches, if you will. I started off as a reservist, went active duty, and now I'm ending out in the National Guard. So. And at what rank? And with other decorations, did you get discharged? You I was discharged as an E5 sergeant, same one I had in 05. Um, I could not uh, reach staff sergeant, which is the next rank higher, because I was lacking the time in for active duty, which makes sense. If you're not going to be, say, at a company or a workplace to be the manager there, for, you know, why would they promote you? Mm -hmm. Same with the Army. There, there's no need to promote you if you're not going to be there to fill that slot. To continue on. Exactly. So I could not fill that slot, so uh, I was discharged at the rank, uh, which I'm currently still holding as sergeant. And where were you when you were discharged? Fort Drum, New York, where it all started. And now do you go to Worcester again, or where do you no, go? No, I actually now report to Reading. So and I'm how often is that? Once a month. What were your feelings about coming home? Uh, from leaving active duty or yes, coming home from Yes, from leaving Iraq? active duty. I knew it was going to be a big change. Um, I knew deep down that at first I didn't want to. Uh, I guess it's kind of like the college kid who has to leave after the senior year. They kind of don't want to because they, they enjoyed the, you know, the time they had there. I mean, I enjoyed uh, the friends I've had. I still keep in contact with a few of them. Um, the, uh, the times we had, I would say. You know, going out, having a good time, um, playing practical jokes on each other, just the things you do you know, in that certain situation. Talk about some of the practical jokes, if you oh, can. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me see. Uh, they also have to be probably PG rating, I would say. <laughs> so. Well, I do remember an instance where me and my squad leader at the time, uh, 
who was single as well as I was, so we both lived in the barracks. He lived two doors down from me, so every once in a while we'd knock on each other's door and be like, what are you doing today? Nothing. You want to go out? Sure. You know, it's just, that's how we were. We didn't really have anybody. I mean, I was still with my girlfriend, or now my fiance, but she was back here at home uh, going to school. So she was only visiting me, I don't know, maybe once a month if she could, or, or more if she, if she had the time off. But uh, mostly it'd be about uh, for a weekend uh, in a month she'd come up and see me. So me and him had some good times. Uh, I'm trying to think of a particular event we had. That'd probably be good. I do remember actually where they were asking all of, we were doing a move. Uh, um, this is really not a practical joke, more of a, a way to uh, evade capture. We like to use it as everything's a training event. And it was in the wintertime, because remember there was snow. Uh, not a lot, though. We had to move the currently deployed soldiers' stuff, because we were still back home at Drum, to another area. Well, the first sergeant put out that everybody who was in the rank of sergeant or above was supposed to be there. We didn't get that message. <laughs> And we didn't want to get that message because we were supposed to get that message uh, if once we get back to the barracks. They didn't call us or anything or anybody in the barracks where we were, they didn't call us. So we, uh, me and my sergeant, and we actually had one of our soldiers with us, uh, which is a little bit frowned upon, but, you know, it's all in the past and I don't think they can do anything about it right now. But we came back to the barracks and the CQ, which is the charter quarters, pretty much the, the babysitter for the night for the barracks, uh, was a friend of ours. He was also an MP, he was a sergeant, and he told us, he goes, hey, uh, you know, first sergeant's having all the sergeants coming in. He wants us knocking everybody's door who's a sergeant, and they want you to move all the stuff. Well, this event, because you had to move a platoon worth of stuff, that's two, 300 people, into another area, and there's only gonna be about 10, 15 people moving it. It's gonna take a couple hours, and it's on like a Friday night. Actually, it was on a Saturday night. So we didn't want to lose our weekend. So we came up with the genius idea of, okay, we'll stay in the, uh, we'll stay in the room, lock the door, and we just won't answer it. Okay, nobody bothered us. Then the first sergeant came down the, down the, uh, the pathway, and we could see him, and we're kind of like, that's not good. We should probably get out of here. Well, there's only one door in and out of your room but there is a window. <laughs> and thank God we were on the first floor. We utilized uh, the window to, like I said, evade our, uh, our possible capture. So you so, were literal. You didn't get the message or you weren't gonna be there to get the message. We weren't gonna be there to get yeah. the message. Yeah. Ignorance is bliss, we like to say. So we uh, had escaped uh, out the window and left. Uh, we actually went down into Watertown, which is like the, the, the nearest uh, it's a city, the nearest town or city. It's about six miles away from Fort Drum, where they have like an Arby's or a McDonald's, whatever. So we uh, we sat down and had a. I think we just went to McDonald's, had a uh, had a meal, you know, shoot the uh, shoot the breeze, and then we like, right, maybe we should go back. You know, so we had to go get some stuff because we're probably not going to be here for long. So we went back, and there we see first aren't walking back and forth. So now we're like, oh, we got to get back into our room. This is not going to be good. We managed to, uh, to this, this at night, so we jumped into the bushes, which was uh, an interesting fact unto itself. Uh, laid there, and the first time kind of walked by and heard something. So we're just like, all right, we need to stay absolutely still. This is, I know my sergeant himself had to stay absolutely still. Me, I already made it into the room because I was getting his stuff. Uh, just for the night, you know, go stay somewhere else so we weren't looking like we were there. and. Uh, I didn't know where he went. So I'm looking around, you know, looking around the, uh, the area for him. It's kind of like a uh, um, courtyard of an area, you know. Uh, that's what we had pretty much in the middle of all our buildings. So I'm looking around, and of course, me not being the sensible one, I start calling out his name. So I'm asking him, like, you know, where's Sergeant Shankel, Sergeant Shankel, Sergeant Shankel, and I'm getting louder and louder. And then the figure just kind of stopped. And I realized it was the first sergeant. He was walking towards the window. So I just ran out the door, <laughs> left his room unlocked, went upstairs into another buddy's room, looked out the window so I could see who it was, and the first time was right there, looking around to see who that was. And I could see my sergeant sitting in the bushes, just 
hoping not to get caught, because getting caught would just have meant our demise. Just, he was not a man you wanted to, uh, to fool around with. Would he have put you on some sort of special duty? I or? can only imagine his, uh, <laughs> his creativity. He was, a, he was a former drill sergeant, a uh, former uh, what we call a schoolhouse instructor. So he was pretty much, uh, when you think of a very professional, very old school, very strict uh, MP, you look it up in the dictionary and you'll find his face. And uh, so I was just looking down just like, this is going to be bad because if he gets caught, is he going to wrap me out and then we're going to both have some kind of an odd, you know, god awful duty like, you know, sweep the floors or something creative like, you know, shove all the snow off the lawn, which would have been a very big lawn about the size of a football field. But they'd, you know, to get us the point that maybe we shouldn't duck out of something easier. And do you also so. feel that as an MP, um, you're to hold yourself at a higher yes, esteem than, say, the Our, other uh, regulars? We have a quote from, uh, from military police, is of the troops and for the troops. We were created of the troops, so the military police uh, branch or regiment was uh, born out of the army. We're not outsiders. We're not a, a separate entity. We were we were uh, designed from within. And then the for the troops is we are here to support the troops both legally and morally. And at that particular event, I'm not sure if the legally or morally kicked in, but I'm sure later on in life, like we said, it's been about three years, so we can sit back and laugh at it. But sure. at that time, we were sweating bullets. So. So you joined the National Guard when you got out, and yes, have you joined any veterans organizations? I have. I have joined the, uh, the Patriot Guard Riders. Uh, that's the motorcycle uh, club that, uh, I don't even own a motorcycle, but I support them, uh, and I am a member. Uh, they're the ones during funerals. They do the, uh, they do the presidings and- Honor Guard, kind of lead, they things like that. Lead the Honor Guard um, because of those uh, funeral protests that we had uh, mm -hmm. a couple years back and that are still going on today. Have um, you ever been witness to that at a funeral? No, I haven't. Have you joined any others like VFW or yes, American I was, Legion? Um, AMVETS, American Veterans, uh, and I was a part of the uh, VFW. I think I have to renew my uh, membership though. <clears throat> and have you received any veterans benefits? You had mentioned also earlier about some hearing loss. Are you covered by that or you haven't really followed up on that? I haven't really followed up on it, ma'am. Um, what about like I the will. GI Bill or anything I'm like that? I'm going to be using that in the winter. I'm going to be doing a, a couple classes at a community college for winter session. Uh, work towards a criminal justice degree probably. And in that respect, is, is it um, your hope to become a police officer in a city or a town in the future? Some kind of a, a law enforcement agency, be it at any uh, government level, whether it's federal, state, or local, or even private. Would you go back um, in the private sector if, as a police officer, or a, would you go back to Iraq? or? If called, are you saying would I go back as like a civilian? A civilian. I would. Mm -hmm. um, but Will you be called to go back again as a national guardsman? No, I won't. Um, the unit I'm with actually just got back in May, and the I guess the rule of thumb, uh, the general, the national guard from Massachusetts put out was two years stability. I'm still not even on my first year, so if I the earliest I could probably go would be about December of uh, 09. Have you attended any gatherings, or I know it's been a short time, but any reunions of um, any of your group, your old group in the past, or no, any I of haven't. your units? Uh, there, there has been nothing to my knowledge okay. that has uh, shown up. It's obvious to us watching and listening to you that you feel that it's important for you to have served in the military how do you feel it, it's affected you in your life now and going into the future? Well, I, uh, I grew up fast. Um, I matured fast. I do remember being the, uh, the 17, 18 year old kid as I was. And 
the army to change me, and you know, people I think get that notion of the army, oh, it's going to change me and turn me into a robot, and I'm not going to think for myself. It's nothing like that. I, I don't care what anybody says, and I'm going to test to it that it's nothing like that. It's you know, the army likes to utilize individuals and use them, uh, utilize them for groups. You know, uh, creativity, knowledge, past experiences. We take that all consideration. So it's not just, you know, you do this and that's it. We try to find the, uh, the best way, you know, always find the best route. Do you have any other memorable experiences or characters that you want to mention? Memorable experiences? Um, I really don't know, ma'am. I would, I would have to think about that as far as uh, I just like to remember uh, my, my friends that I lost. You know, because I'm the fortunate one. I came home. You mentioned earlier, too, again, that unwritten, unspoken word about you knew some wouldn't come home or may not come home the same. Do you feel you came home the same? No, well, ma'am. Why? What way? Because of the loss of your friends? I would say because of the loss, yes, but just the the time, you know, the time you were there, what you have witnessed, experienced, what you may have made, may have done. Um, it it will change somebody, you know. It's unlike any other. Now, is it changed for good or bad? That's you know, that's for you to decide. You can make it good or bad. I know uh, people who have come back and have referred to, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol as their outlet. I know people who have gone to seminars and have, uh, you know, taught or instructed on their experiences. Some may have gone to other schools, I mean, not schools, but uh, uh, military installations for training where they are, you know, the subject matter expert and they're teaching you know, the younger soldiers who are coming up who have to uh, fill in our ranks. And, you know, they utilize themselves there. So I would say... Where are you in everybody. all of that? Uh, I would be... I would like to be the one who would train those uh, either going or those who are coming in. And can you do that in, in your... Um position in the National Guard, knowing that some of them will possibly be deployed in the future? Uh, right now, in every unit there is a training NCO, but that's usually the person, the, uh, the designated sergeant, who does the weekend training, not necessarily training you for uh, a deployment, not necessarily training you uh, for any kind of a mission, but more of an overall, the person who does the, uh, you know, the teacher, the one who sets up the, uh, the instruction book and gets you ready for that, uh, that particular weekend's training. Mm -hmm. um, I have taken upon myself, when I came into the National Guard, I have trained uh, those soldiers uh, because in the unit that I was with right now, uh, the National Guard, there's only a few of us who have been deployed uh, because a lot of them were new coming in. So a lot of them have looked upon me and the others uh, for you know, uh, any kind of helpful uh, tips if they do go over, or some of them who are going to be going over shortly, whether it be uh, this year or the next year. So it's because of your experiences, too, and as you said, you've matured, so that though both of those, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but because of your background mm -hmm. and your experiences, people are looking up to you for information. I would say, that like yes, um, I, don't, I don't think people... Uh, look up to me uh, as of, you know, I think it's more they're looking to me as the go-to for that kind of information, for that kind of training. Uh, I tell people if they, if they look up to me, they need a better role model. Now, along with the National Guard, since you've been home, are you working elsewhere? You did mention you're going to take some courses, but... I have, right now, I work uh, doing landscaping. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just something to get me outside and enjoy the blistering weather. Or actually right now as it's uh, pouring on us. 
Is there anything that we haven't asked or any comment or something that you would like to share with not only your family who will get, you'll get a copy of this mm -hmm. interview, but also with those who might borrow it from this library? Anything else you'd like to leave us with? I would say that uh, there's a lot of veterans coming home. All right. Um, I know during the Vietnam era, which is when my parents grew up, those veterans weren't treated with any kind of respect. I've read about it, I've seen uh, archive footage, um, I've heard firsthand accounts. A couple of my friends, uh, my father's friends and parents' friends uh, have those kind of friends. And they, uh, I would say you need to, to anybody who's watching this, whether it's friends, family, or a third party, that veterans are people, okay? They have been asked or volunteered to do, uh, you know, what's not, uh, what's not common amongst uh, corporate America, not common amongst, you know, this kind of a lifestyle that we live here. We were asked to go do something, and we did it. No questions asked, no reservations for it. We did it, and that's, that's been done. But like I said, there's more veterans coming home every day and they need your help and they need your support. <clears throat> There's plenty of organizations out there who reach out to these veterans. But, you know, we can always, we can always uh, thank them. And I, and, I, and I include myself in that too. Not as necessarily the veteran, but somebody who wants to help them. Like I said, I can walk and talk. You know, I'm fully functional in my life, but I have a, a close friend of mine who is missing his, uh, his right arm right now. And I've had a, a friend who lost his eye. These are just two people I know firsthand, never mind the thousands of uh, you know, uh, service members who are returning home, uh, whether from a war injury or because of a war injury. And do they so, feel that they are getting appropriate help? From what I've talked to, I think they said that the, it has improved. Uh, I'm sure at first, when it's not working, it, it can't just change in a day. You know, they say Rome wasn't built in a day. Well, now there is you know, anything else. It takes time, but over time, they, uh, the friends I've talked to, they said that's gotten a lot better. Technology's gotten better. The care itself has gotten better. Um, their acceptance back into society has gotten better. Uh, veterans sometimes feel secluded uh, from, I, I guess you say, you know, the, the civilian society. Because the life we live or what we may have done in our lifetimes, you know, so. Well, Michael S. Lang, I want to thank you. This was a very, very interesting interview, and I certainly respect all that you've done. I think others who see this will also think differently about the day-to-day -day workings of the current-day veteran, and I want to thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. Thank you.